You're listening to Popcorn and Politics. What's the real deal? Hosted by Audrey Bell Kearney and Derek J. Wilson. Asking the hard-hitting questions you want answers to. From political leaders and political hopefuls from around the world. Good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon, all my people out there. Listen, it's a beautiful day here. Um, Derek is running behind, but he should be here shortly. I got a great guest for you today. I, but before I do that, I just got to give y'all, I got to tell y'all something. So last night, the Great East Side Chamber hosted its um, first gala of the year, the annual inauguration for the 10-year celebration for the Great East Side Chamber, which I sit on the board as the director of media and technology. And Derek is the president of that of the board. So we had our gala last night, and it was so funny because um, it was so many elected officials in the house and so many candidates in the house. It was crazy. So my husband, I had to float around because, of course, we were running the event, um, Derek and I. And so we were kind of floating around. We really didn't sit down as much. We was all over the place. But my husband sat at a table. And so um, it was a it was a reserve table. It was my table, reserve table. But it was some other people sitting there. So I didn't really know who was going to be sitting at the table. I just want to make sure that he and my friends had a place to sit while I floated around the building. <laughs> so he came. So later on, I sat down. He said, "Every judge, every judge running for Georgia is sitting at this table." It was hilarious. So we had he was sitting at a table full of judges, and um, I thought that was so funny. But um, it was a beautiful, beautiful event yesterday, and. Um, you know, um, it, we got a chance to meet a lot of people. We had um, District Attorney Patsy Austin Gatson in the in the audience. We had um, Commissioner uh, woman Commission Woman Nicole Love Henderson, which is who is the chair Commission Chair for Gwinnett County. We had Judge Veronica Cope in the house. We had some, uh, State Representative um, Don McLeod, State Representative Rebecca Mitchell. We had oh my God, it was so many. I know I'm leaving out some people. Tracy Kaysen, um we had political candidates like uh, Jason T. Hayes, who was on the show last week, run, also running for lieutenant governor, um, was in the house last night. We had uh, Andre Johnson running for court um, uh, judge. It was, just, it was now mind you, it was a lot of officials and soon to be possibly uh, officials, but there were a lot of people in the room. We had a house, the house was full, y'all. And this was our first event that Derek and I pulled together li literally in two months. Like he decided he wanted to throw a gala in January. And March 19th, the gala happened. Now, I got to tell y'all, and I said this at the event, Derek, when Derek wants something to happen, he makes it happen. Even against my me saying, oh, I think we should wait. No, I don't think we should do it that way. He still I'm like, no, I'm going to do it. And he does it. And it turned out really great. We had about 125 people over at Vines Mansion last night. It was beautiful. So I'm, I'm exhausted. So he's somewhere. I don't know where he is. I guess he'll be in here shortly. But anyway. My guest today is here. So, we, you know, the governor's race is going to be a heated one. And, you know, we were talking about this. And, and so my guest, he'll be able to shed some more light on this. But, you know, when President um, Biden ran for president, Kamala was his running mate. So that, that was his partner. And we knew that if he won, she was going to be vice president. Well, that's not how the, uh, the governor's race run. So the governor has to run for his seat. And so does the lieutenant governor, which you, you would think that that was an appointed position, kind of like the president and the vice president. But that's not how it works. So um, last week we talked to Jason T. Was it, late, was it last week? I think it was last week. Was it last week we talked to Jason? Anyway, Jason, <clears throat> Jason T. Hayes is also running for, for lieutenant governor. So as I guess today, Representative Eric Allen. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to bring uh, Representative Allen into the into the room. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. All right, we're good. We're good. <laughs> thank, thank you. Goodness, thank goodness. Thank goodness. I'm glad to have you here. Thank you so much. Um, this is always an interesting platform to me, and it's it's interesting because um, when I have to talk to people running for the same party. It's always interesting to see what people are going to say, because it's like, OK, what do you say when you got the same people running for the same party in the same party running for the same position? And so but I want I want to first want to give you the opportunity to tell people who you are. And then I got a, I got a very interesting question that I got from you from a young lady I had coffee with last week and she was a Republican. And okay. she shared some. She asked me a question that I could not answer because I'm not running for lieutenant governor or any elected office. But maybe you can answer this. So. Before we get into that, please All introduce right. yourself. So thank you, uh, Ms. Curry, for having me today. I am State Representative Eric Allen. Uh, I represent Georgia's 40th district, which straddles Cobb and Fulton County. So it's more North Atlanta, uh, all of Vinings in Cobb County, a little bit of Smyrna, a little bit of Mabel. 
uh, been in office since uh, 2018. Uh, first ran for the seat in 2014. Took me a couple of times. I tell people I ran, I ran for this house. It was a 60 40 gerrymandered district uh, mm. with 20 year incumbent Republican. I ran in 2014, back before running as a Democrat was cool in Georgia. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and I, I did just what we thought we'd do. We got 41%. But on election night, instead of talking about how good of a job we did, I talked about the future and said, I'm going to run again in 2016. Mm-hmm. 2016, we got 46% of the vote. Um, and the same thing, said, I'm going to run again. In 2018, was able to flip the seat. And in 2021, re-election with almost 60% of the vote. So I have taken a district from 60-40 Republican to 60-40 Democrat. Uh, wow. In the state house, I um, who knows? I know, right? It's uh, you know, it, it's it's our time, and it's a lot of people talk about the demographic changes in Georgia, but I can tell you, the demographics in the district didn't change. What happened is Georgians got on the ground and started knocking on doors, making phone calls, and so the advocacy community in Georgia is just phenomenal. Um, they know how to the, to energize, to mobilize uh, voters, and that's really what's made the difference. Uh, so. Back in uh, last last March, uh, I decided to uh, to run for lieutenant governor. I know you're going to ask a lot of questions about it, so I won't get too much into uh, to all the reasons why. But I'll just say that, you know, the the lieutenant governor role is an extremely important role, especially on the the cusp of nominating and, and electing our first female governor um, to this seat. Um, she is going to need a governing partner, and Georgians are going to need a governing duo that really understand the legislation, how to get things done. And with my experience, both as a, as a leader in state government, when I was working with the Department of Behavioral Health, Developmental Disabilities as executive director prior to running for office, but also being in the legislature. And, and I'll add that I am the only legislator in either chamber, House or Senate, who has ever served as a working member and a leader in our government and also as a leader in, um, in uh, the legislature. So I look forward to, to the conversation and talking more about the platform and answering any of these questions. You, I heard the lead in and, and you're absolutely right. The role of lieutenant governor in Georgia is very unique uh, compared to other states around the country. So we can talk about that as well. OK, well, let's start there because my you know, we had that conversation and he was like, you would think that that would be an appointed position just like um just like the governor. But let me just say this real quick. So Derek has joined us. Hello. Thanks for joining us. Party animal? No, no, I'm just kidding. So I talked. I told, him about, I told him about the chamber gala last night. You couldn't get up this morning. Nothing, that's what. That's not what I said. But anyway, yeah, too, much, too, much too much fun. Too much fun. Too much fun. Yeah. I was telling. I was telling. Um, I was talking about how my husband said. He said. Um, everybody at this table is running for a judge or is a judge. It was hilarious, Derek. Like, because everybody at the table was either I think it was Matt Miller. Tracy Kaysen and some other folks. I don't, mean, I don't even know who else was there. Yeah, you like, had a, the was a judge. You had it was table. hilarious. Well, what you, yeah. you got to tell him, the good, the good thing about that is I, the, the first day of business law when I was in school, they came in and said, here's, here's, the, here's how law works in, in one, one sentence. A good lawyer knows the law. A great lawyer knows the judge. So <laughs> whenever you sit at a table and know some judges, you're doing all right. <laughs> all right. Well, there you go. We got it. Um, there, you know, um, I, had a, I had a cup of coffee. I'm going to start right here because this... We hear this all the time, Medicaid expansion, Medicaid expansion, Medicaid expansion, Medicaid expansion, right? So I had a cup of coffee last week with a young lady who who was a, who was a Republican, but she said to me, listen, I'm going to vote on the side, even though she grew up Republican, she was going to vote on the side that met her goals and needs. So I said to her, well, answer me this question. It was, And she's really nice, had a great, a great chat with her, and I learned something. I said, answer this question for me. I said, I said, if I need health care or I need internet or whatever I need, if the if the party that's gonna give me what I need, why would I not vote for them? Yep. Right? Because I don't I don't understand that mentality because I need health care. I gotta have internet to make things happen, but I choose to vote against that party that's gonna give me the things I need. She said to me, What are we giving up for that? And I said, what do you mean? She said, because if they're giving us free health care or whatever, what, what do we have to give up? Because I value my privacy. And 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 as she said, she does a lot with alternative health stuff, like alternative medicine, vitamins and supplements. So that was her way. And I was like, wow, I had never thought about it. I couldn't wrap my head around why you would not want health care. But she felt like she was giving up something to get free health care or explain the health care. And so I don't know, can you speak to that or not? But I thought that was eye-opening. 
I can't. And I, I'm so glad you asked that question because we sometimes we get caught up where everybody likes, you know, there's a lot of buzzwords and, and democratic policy, especially expand Medicaid, expand Medicaid. Nobody knows what that means. They, they, I mean, very, very few candidates and those of us that are in the Capitol every day and looking at the budget and fighting over those things, un understand what that means. To that young lady, what, what I would say to her is you're not giving up anything. You're actually getting. What people don't realize when the Affordable Care Act passed 12 years ago, every Georgian right now is paying into that pool. The problem is we're not getting everything drawn back down that we are putting in. We are leaving billions of dollars on the table. So when we talk about expanding Medicaid, it, the question is not, what do you have to give up? It's the question of what have you been giving up the last 12 years? If we were to expand Medicaid today, not only would it not cost Georgia one penny, it would bring almost $2 billion back into our state budget to be spent on other things. That could be reopening some of our rural hospitals and giving them some grants so they can be, be viable until we you know, get, get all of them back on their feet with, with insured Georgians. Uh, it could be put into our mental health programs, uh, which we woefully underfund in the state. Um, it could be put into substance abuse. It could be put into programs to um, you know, aid returning citizens from prison back into the community. Th there are tons of things that we could do. If we had $2 billion extra in our budget, and just think, in the last two budgets, the supplemental, uh, and if I get too far in the weeds, just tell me to pull up, but the supplemental budget for 22 and the 23 fiscal year budget, we returned a billion dollars to taxpayers. In, wow. in just tax rebates, okay? So everybody's going to get, if you're single, you're going to get 250 If you're a joint filer, you're going to get $500 rebate. And then there's going to be a tax cut, a billion-dollar tax cut coming in 2025, all because Republicans said, we got too much money. Mm. But we could expand Medicaid for zero, and their argument is we can't afford it. So it's wow. really about priority. So I would just tell the young lady, walking her through all of that, that it's not about what you're giving up. It's about what you have already given up and won't be able to recoup because the 12, 12 past years of failed leadership has refused to provide Georgians that need it the most access to health care, but benefiting our entire state by giving money. Like I said, right now, it would be a net positive to our, our budget to expand Medicaid. Wow. Wow. You, you know, so, so I do have a... Go ahead, go ahead, Derek. I do have a question on, on that because I'm I'm looking at your website and it says healthcare justice. Could you explain? So every, so to, to me, there's such an imbalance in, in Georgia. Everything that I do and my my four pillars of, of my platform are all about justice. OK, all right, you got right. education justice, you got environmental justice, you got economic justice and you got social justice. All right. When, when you, I mean, and, and the health justice, and I consider that under the social piece. But when you when you think about health justice, the the minority and, and disenfranchised communities in Georgia are the ones getting hit worse than first by not expanding Medicaid and doing some of the things we can do with healthcare. Um, and I looked at y'all's profiles too, and I believe, uh, Audrey, you're from um, Albany. Albany. Yep. I was gonna say I was gonna say Augusta, but it's Albany. Y'all have had a hospital close in the last five years. Yeah. Um, you know, y'all, I, I, I drove, went to Albany quite a bit when I worked for the state going down to Thomasville, one of our seven mental health hospitals. You get onto that corridor, there, that, there is so much health disparity when you get down, the closer you get to Florida in South Georgia. You know, we got over 80 counties without an OBGYN. You know, we've got 100 counties plus that are underserved for health care. We've got a health crisis with the lack of doctors and nurses in some of our communities. And once again, those not only hit the, the areas of a racial class, they also disparately impact a financial class of Georgians. And we gotta be realistic about that. And I, you know, I, I think rural voters, poor rural voters have more in common with black voters than they think. Yeah. Right, yeah, you know? right. I, I agree. And, and, and but we, yet, but yet, but yet, the poor rule always tend to vote against because you know, they're better. Because the message, you know, I, I once again, I, I am the only candidate in this race. Now think about this for a second. I, and I mean this. I am the only person out of nine people in a crowded field that has ever run in a general election in November and won. Beat a Republican. I've done it twice. Okay. We, we cannot win the football game in the first quarter. 
We cannot elect somebody who runs for May, but does not know how to take a message to the goal line in November. The, the reason that they vote against their interest is we don't have the right people going down and talking to them. The reason mm -hmm. you had a Stacey Abrams make so much inroads, the reason you had a Raphael Warnock make so many inroads in those communities, they went down and they go down with a strong message. They understand how to communicate so that people don't retreat back into their comfort zone. Of my, my mama was an R, my daddy was an R, I'm an R, so I got to go vote R. All right. You have to go lay out the, 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 the argument. You have to build a case and explain to them. Don't just yell, expand Medicaid. Talk to them about how the Medicaid expansion of the Affordable Care Act is a jobs creation bill. Think about that for a minute. Mm. When, when, when the Affordable Care Act was implemented in 2012, if you had an idea, you had an innovation, you had an entrepreneurial spirit, you no longer were tied to the job that gave you health care. You could take your risk and launch your business. Most of what we see with the gig economy today is because the Affordable Care Act collapsed health care from a corporation. Mm -hmm. You know, you think about when, when corporations hold their employees, they've got time off, they've got retirement, and they've got health care. Right. Nobody really fusses over time off anymore. They only give you two weeks. You don't need that. You know, you that, that's gone before you get it. 401ks came along and busted up pensions. Okay, think about it. The last thing these corporations had to hold on to people was health care. So you, you break that away from your big corporations. Anyone with an idea can go out. So now you go to those people and say, look, expanding Medicaid and making, making health care accessible is not just about a health justice. It's also about economic justice because you have less families being bankrupt because they get ill. You have more people able to open that coffee shop they wanted to open, but they couldn't leave their, their, their nine to five because they were giving them insurance. Right. Wow. So okay. It's. So, so the health justice, economic justice, all of them really wrap into one conversation that I think we need to go sell across the state. And we gotta have the right people in the right place at the right time to do that. Wow. I think that's interesting because I think when I when I talked to this young lady, fear of privacy being breached is one of her top things. Um, but the other thing that I thought was interesting is that she she felt like you should have take control of your own health through alternative health methods. Now, there are a lot of naturalists out there that they don't take any, no, they don't want to take any medicine. They're not taking any medicine. They don't even want to go to a hospital. So, but, but I, I felt like for her to feel like everybody should do that, that was being unrealistic, right? Because people right. are not going to do that. They're not going to take vitamins and think that's all. Cause you go, especially if you go to church, God going to do it. So God and the doctor going to do it. It ain't going to be. You heard that you know, Folk, folk going to church talking about, I ain't going to wear no mask. If God want me to get it, they get it. So That's right. <laughs> so, but but that was her, her that was her view, and I thought that was pretty interesting. So, um, moving forward, what's your message can I, on can that? I, can I, can yeah. I comment on that real quick? Yeah, because yeah. the you know it's it's funny, and this is where when you have those conversations one on one, it, it's 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 good to call people out on that and say, well, you know, you you're speaking on one one side of your, your mouth about freedom. And then you're talking about what you want to do or what, what can be mandated with medicine and all. We want the freedom for all. Let, let's make sure everybody's got access to health care, but it's the health care they choose. All right. And, and we got to, you know, so so let's say we both agree. We both agree on the same thing. We don't want to sacrifice privacy, whether that be your data or your right to use holistic medicine over Western medicine. You know, we, we don't, I, I agree, I would agree with her 100%. Let's, let's relieve all that red tape and let you choose what works for you. But let's also agree at the same time, we'll be a better society if we don't focus on healthcare, if we focus on wellness. Mm. And that's a whole justice component as well. Let's talk about fresh foods. Let's talk about our food. Right. Let's talk right. about, yeah. let, let's not wait to a crisis to insert an insurance company. Let's talk about wellness and start doing things that can, can create a healthier environment and lifestyle. So it's not an either or, it's kind of a both and a holistic approach. Wow. wow. So That's going into your uh, economic justice, uh, I know uh, Audrey, who's originally from Albany, uh, always talk about how uh, Albany has a, a airport, one of the most private uh, cities in not just Georgia, in the, in the country. I've sent her multiple articles over the past year just how every time it pops up every time they do a, a list of some of the, the poorest uh cities in the country albany is always in the top five yep and so 
Uh, okay, my question is, as Lieutenant Governor, your economic justice, how does that fall into helping areas like that? So a couple of things. One, with, with areas like Albany, they, they have all the ingredients. I mean, they got all, all everything you need to, to be a bustling urban center. The problem is we don't call them that. We still call, it, it is the only city in this state with a commercial airport. You said airport, but it's got a commercial airport. Yeah. And we still call a rural city. We don't, we don't even consider it an urban center. Mm. So part, part of it is the, the concept of understanding that Albany is a, a, a forgotten urban city. It's an urban center. And our investment should follow it. If we were to, you know, one of the things that I, I tell people, and they say, well, as Lieutenant Governor, what's one of the biggest things you can do? I'm going to ask the question for you. What's the biggest, one of the biggest things you can do? One of the biggest things we can do is start building our communities. And when I say building our communities, it's been a long time since we've had a Democratic governor and lieutenant governor. What that does is when you have a governor and lieutenant governor coming to Albany, meeting with your mayors, your city council members, meeting with your school board members, propping them up, giving them a platform and a voice, start building them. You know, and I mean this across all of our cities. You know, they, they have been out there on their own with a Republican leadership who likes to kind of come fly in and fly out. But you know, not really invest in that in that community. To sit down and say, what are the type of businesses that you need? You know, we've got the governor bragging about a, a plant east of Atlanta that the, the people don't even want, but he wanted to campaign on. Why not talk to some of these forgotten urban centers and have that conversation with them and say, look, how, how do we bring some business to you? How, how do we help take some of the sting out of the jobs that you lost? You know, how, how do we bring in more jobs and not just jobs, but good paying jobs. Problems, and you talk about, you know, cities that are constantly depressed as far as their, their average income, everything else. It's because all jobs ain't created equal. We like to yeah. give the good jobs in some areas than jobs in others. I don't, I don't want to talk about jobs. We talk about good paying jobs. If you're mm -hmm. not willing to pay Georgians a livable wage, we don't need you here. We got enough people not paying our people livable wages. We need to we need to be conscious and attract and recruit the companies that are going to do well by our communities, not just come into our community so they can do well. It's a difference. So okay. with the leadership in Albany, because you know I, I kind of questioned it once, and someone went to smack smack my head off, but I, you know I retracted. I was like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know, um, with the with the with the leadership in Albany, are there resources that they're missing out on? that they can't find like because i feel like if you're in leadership you should do you not all talk together to each other um with the leadership that's there like i don't i don't understand that process they they should and i'm sure every mayor and city council in this state would if the opportunity approached itself the question is do we have a government that's reaching out to them the right way i think mm -hmm. you're going to start to see some of these things happen because also you gotta you gotta recall we just got two democratic senators if, right. if you were a local elected official and a Democrat in Georgia, you were not listening. I mean, you had so many layers that you were below before you can get access to the resources. And and, and I don't mean financial. I'm just saying information. Right. You know, if you look at Ref, Reverend Raphael Warnock's office, his staff has been in South Georgia. He's been in South Georgia more than any visible Democrat you've seen. I mean, and that's needed. That's what you right. need. But with that comes awareness, which will then bring the resources to follow. But when you've got people in leadership who don't even want to be aware of what your struggles are, that's just your yeah. problem. That's a yeah. you problem. Mm -hmm. It makes a difference. So I think, you know, this election, man, I, 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 people say it, but it can't be understated. This is an election of a lifetime. If, if we can have the trifecta at national, state, and local government in some of these forgotten areas, that's when you'll start to see some investment the right way. You know, start... You know, you know, somebody at the state that says, you know what, I don't want to do a billion dollar tax cut and give it to every Georgian because every Georgian don't need it. How about we take that billion dollars and invest it to the communities that we know need it most? Yeah, that's leadership. Yeah, that's leadership. Right now, we, we don't have that type of thinking in the positions that matter of governor, lieutenant governor, secretary of state, attorney general. If we get all of those and we have the federal, we have the senators. We have a White House for the next two years at least, and hopefully the next six all right. and beyond. Then, then we start to see a lot of things change. If you think about, you know, I, I live and represent Cobb County. I'm the chair of the Cobb County delegation. 
a lot of the investment and the growth and the boom in Cobb County has been directly because Johnny Isaacson, a, a very powerful senator from Cobb County, had all the relationships. So don't think that this stuff is not about relationships. It is completely about relationships. But we, but to, to that flip side, we've also got to make sure that we're giving our elected officials the grace and space to do what's needed to bring those investments in. One thing that we do as Democrats is sometimes if they're not a purist and they ain't saying exactly what I want them to hear, well, I ain't going to go vote for them no more because they ain't done nothing for me. Yeah. We already hearing about the presidential campaign of 2024. I, Joe Biden ain't done nothing for me. I, but you know what? Sometimes not getting kicked in the face is, <laughs> is a win. Yeah. 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 I agree. I don't have so, to agree. <clears throat> so small businesses right now, small businesses, one of the things that we always need is access to funding. Absolutely. And there's a lot of money floating around Georgia. And we know there is, but a lot of small businesses still do not have access to that funding, especially minority owned businesses. How can we make that process more simple? Because there there have been monies floating around for the last two years that we just have not been able to to access. And I feel like that money could have saved some of our businesses. What what can make that process simpler? You know, they, they, that money could have. And I know uh, I know where you're coming from with this one, but the the. Mm -hmm. There were multiple ways, and, and and don't don't think that the money is not still floating around. Mm -hmm. Cities and counties still have a lot of money. And All that right. money can be given as grants to already established businesses. Uh, they've done it in various counties across the state where they have worked with either chambers of commerce or other nonprofits to do grants and get some of that money into the hands of some of our small businesses. So it's not too late to do that. And we should be advocating for that on every level. Uh, to make sure that that happens. But when you talk about, you know, the once again, banking is a relationship. You know, I sit on the banks and banking committee and I've had many a conversation with with banks and and different administrators on how do we how do you get that money in? And even when the PPP loans were coming out, a lot of that was built on relationship. Yeah. And a lot of our small businesses are unbanked or not properly banked um, and don't have the relationships to go in and get that that money. So some of it is how do we bridge that gap? You know, er everything, and I, I, I've i listened to a lot of my colleagues who are running for this seat. Um, everything ain't legislative fix. We, we got, I mean, everybody want to talk about getting legislation passed and I'm going to do that. Well, first of all, Lieutenant Governor can't introduce legislation. I'm going to tell you that. So by law, so any, anybody tell you they're going to get bills passed and they're going to do this, then you can influence it. But the Lieutenant Governor can't introduce legislation. But what you can do is be that bridge builder. You've got a megaphone and, and a platform that can bring those community leaders together. Uh, you know, one of the things I talk about that's not often mentioned with the role of Lieutenant Governor is not only do you get a few dozen appointments to different boards and authorities across the state, you can commission your own boards and authorities that can influence and advise the legislature. Right now, the Lieutenant Governor's got about five or six, one of them's on um, small business, one's on workforce challenges, one is on, um, uh, innovation and technology. He wants to, you know, Atlanta to be the technology hub of the East, East Coast. All, all this stuff. All, no one can stop you as Lieutenant Governor from commissioning that. No one can stop me as Lieutenant Governor from pulling a group of business leaders from across the state and banks across the state, putting them in a room together and say, how do we solve this problem about being underbanked and under-resourced as minority businesses? Wow. So you said oh, wow. something. So Derek, you know I'm about to go with this, right? Because because I don't asked all the candidates in the last probably four episodes about this one question, because I feel like it's one that um, nobody's talked about. You know, they talk about Medicaid expansion and economic development, but not one candidate has ever said that brought up that that's on the agenda about technology. And so yeah. when I think about the the generation right now, that the, not the Xers, but the millennials and the, the Z generation, yeah, everything right. is about technology for them. And so. Mm -hmm. Um, is there a tech agenda? Do you have one? Because I haven't heard one candidate yet say they got a tech agenda. And I think- Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Before you, well, no, no, before you go into that, when you were saying relationships with banking, and and, and, and this ties into what Audrey was said, because, you know, now we in, you know, this is 2022, a lot of bank accounts now are just simply online banks. Yeah. yeah. And so that, be, so that ran into an issue when, you know, the PPP came out when, I don't have 
uh, Sally that I can go into the bank and sit down and get, and she remember me when I started my business. I have, uh, you know, I, I opened my bank account online that's in Michigan, <laughs> you know. So, you know, how does how does the new laws and new programs coming out uh, relate to technology? Like, how does it merge the technology together so where I'm not getting penalized for using modern technology? Yeah, I, I, I don't I, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Um, I, I mean, if, if you if you are a small business owner and you have your bank account, then you need to have a relationship with somebody in the walls of that bank, regardless of the technology. Uh, you may never go in and see them, but at least well, no, some banks are just completely online banks now. Yeah, some are, but the the ones that yes, but they're also still a majority of our banks for the consumers. Yes, a majority of them are moving online. For business accounts, first of all, I would encourage anyone with a business not to go to a, a purely 100% online, online bank. Okay. That, that, I mean, that's an educational component because you, you know, when I ran my business, I used to always tell my CFO, the worst time to ask for a loan is when you need one. Mm -hmm. You know, just like anything else, just in life, the worst time to go apply for a credit card is when you need one because that means everything's probably on the way down. You know, right. you, you know, so you, you want to have that relationship with a banker of some sort. So the first thing is, yes, technology is great. You may never go in there to do a transaction, but you need to go in there and talk to them about your business, about your plan, about your needs, about your trajectory of your business. Uh, so that's the first thing. We can't, just because technology is there doesn't mean it supplants everything that we know is good for business. Um, okay. Some of those relationships still have to be there. And to your point, Audrey, the to me, there's always a technology agenda. I don't think there's anything we can do without technology. Uh, you know, in my platform, when I talk about economic justice, one of the things I talk about is, you, I think you mentioned it earlier today, was rural broadband and having access. Um, you know, to me, that's a part of that economic engine that you have to have uh, in order to do that. That is a thread that goes across, you know, everything. To me, technology has almost become one of those things that kind of fall into the background. You know, you don't even think about it. You know, it's almost like the, like the wind. Right now, the the different amounts of technology that we're using right now to conduct this conversation it is just immense, but we don't even think about it. We just kind of go, you know, we go through it and we, you know, we, so the technology is always there um, as a component to everything we do. We can't talk about education justice without talking about technology. Right. You know, we learn that from I, I, I agree. But I think, I think when we look at new technologies and I think some people think that they're so, they're so far away and they really aren't. And, and you can tell they aren't when you see the big dogs like Mark Zuckerberg and, you know, Microsoft and Adidas and all of the, you know, gaming platforms, they're already there for the average consumer. We, it'll take about another three years for us to get there. In the meantime, you know, there are jobs that could be created. There are um, careers that could be created. There are businesses that could be created. And so, we need to prepare our communities for those jobs and for those businesses to be able to start, but they also need to be some funding in place. And I'll give you a prime example. So as I said earlier, Derek is the president of the Greater East Side Chamber of Commerce. And one of the things we want to do is launch our metaverse for that chamber, for our members, right? Because we know small businesses just don't have the time to do that, but the chamber needs funding to do that. How can the chamber access funding for that? So, so that so the small business owner who's already working on a limited amount of money or capital don't have to come out of pocket to help produce the metaverse for themselves, which is going to cost anywhere between thirty thousand to five hundred thousand dollars. So, when I say that, I think about that's what I'm thinking about because we deal a lot with small business owners and we want to help them take the business to the next level. But we know, as a mom and pop or solopreneur, this is not funding out there for something like that, right? Not for most, maybe some, but not for most. And so now we have this this new generation of entrepreneurs. We have this old generation of entrepreneurs who are definitely afraid of tech altogether. They need to be educated. You got this new group who say, you know what, we want to do it, but we don't have the cash. How do we bridge that gap right there? And how do we help organizations like the Chamber secure funding so we can build these platforms so our, our members don't get left behind and they can compete on a higher level? Yeah, and I, and I think we're saying the exact same thing. I'm just saying it from the standpoint of the technology inv is invisible. What you just talked about is an economic issue. Mm -hmm. You know, getting, getting the funding, the technology is there. Mm -hmm. Right. How do people reach it? 
Right. You know, they, the arms are just a little bit too short to grab on to, you know, what they're, what they're trying to grasp at. How do you bridge that gap? That You're asking the absolute right question. How, how does the state, what role does the state play in funding mm -hmm. some of those initiatives? You know, right. giving more grants through economic development, um, you know, giving more um, grants through community development. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you work with your cities? Right now, we are, uh, once again, uh, I said it earlier, so I won't, you know, say it too emphatically, but you know, we just gave a billion dollars back. I'm not saying we don't need to give that back to taxpayers. We don't need to give that billion dollars back to the hardworking people of Georgia. It's just a matter of where do you give it back? Right. Where do you divert those funds? You know, and I think that we could, working with people like yourselves who are in a chamber and all the great chambers across the state with the Georgia Chamber of Commerce, find out where are those pockets. I, I, as a taxpayer, would feel much better putting that billion dollars into a grant fund saying, yes, we did a great job as a, as a state. We've got extra money. Let's put that into this grant program and let's help our educators, our small businesses, our healthcare systems who are struggling. All of yeah. those can you, we, we don't need to give it back in the form of $76 per Georgia. That ain't going to make a dent. Right. It's not, but that right. money could be. So I, I think we're saying the same thing is that it's not, just the technology it's how do we make it reachable for people? how do we make it accessible to people right. so they can what's run their the business plan? what's the plan man what's the plan well like i said you first start to put a budget together that's a, a that reflects the priorities of georgia a, a budget is you know I, I learned this when i first got to the legislature somebody said the budget is not about the money it shows the priorities of the state yeah you think about that that's you know pages and pages and pages i got my book here somewhere um, it'll blow your mind to see how thick that budget book is. We look at it year, and uh, it, it all it is is an outlay of the priorities of the state. What I'm suggesting to people is we need people to understand how that works and shift those priorities just a little bit. When you have that surplus, how do you how do you want that to be spent? Do you want it to be spent as an election year ploy where the governor can say I gave everybody a five hundred dollar check in their taxes, or do you want that money to go to small businesses? Go to educators who are having to dip out of their own pocket to pay for basic supplies for schools. Um, you know, how do you want that money to be spent? And I think that's the question that we need to be solving. That's a good question. But here's the other here's another question on top of that question. So if you ask regular everyday citizens, do you want that money to go to this fund or do you want that five hundred dollars to go in that check to you? How do you how do you say they, they're gonna say send me five hundred dollars? So what how do you how they they are if you, go to, if you go to them with that question, but right. but the the, the it, it is an election year ploy. I'm telling you, we it's it's ironic. We only have these surpluses on every four years. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that that money is not extra money. Something is being cut. Something you 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 think about all the different things across states been underfunded. That money is not just extra money. I don't know anybody that drives down our roads or or is sitting at home without internet or is sitting in a school that is, is, is using books from the 1990s and 80s. I don't think any of them will tell you that the state has way too much money and we need to just get, get rid of it. All I right. think they would be just fine knowing that that money was invested smartly. That, that's my proposition. Well, Rep. Uh, Allen, let's say this is uh, a year from now. This is uh, March 20th, 2023. You within your first 100 days as lieutenant governor, what would that look like? You know, it'll it'll look like a Georgia that's more reflective of of the people that live here. Um, you know, one of the things that I've talked about doing is I want to open up the the lieutenant governor's office of legislative of uh, uh, legislative equity, and what that is is a is a is a group of community leaders who look at every piece of legislation and score it on what is the impact to everyday Georgians, people of color, and disenfranchised communities. Just bringing that awareness out. Right now, there's so many things that get passed. You know, we, we pass so many bills and everything gets done. Nobody takes the time to slow down and stop and really grade and look at it. We got all the talking points about it, but what does it really mean? I think if we start to do that, we'll start to answer some of those questions. Well, this is gonna give funding to small businesses who are in the top, 15 to 20% of revenue earners. You know, what about the other ones? What are, we, what, what are we doing for them? So I think in those first 100 days, we'll start to see, uh, first of all, we'll have uh, a, a chamber that uh, 
is more respectful to all sides, um, who allows open debate, um, who is responsive. Uh, one of the other things I've committed to is doing a weekly fireside chat with what's going on in the Senate. What have we passed? What have we done? Um, you know, I, I think it's going to be a different a different era. I think you're also going to have a Democratic governor uh, who's going to set out the priorities through a budget that will answer a lot of these questions. Um, it, it will it, it will make sure that we are prioritizing the right things and funding the right things the right way so that we can have a just Georgia, to have more equity, um, to have more people at the table. I, I want to bring as many people into this process as possible. And being there, being down in the Capitol, I understand that's not, you know, especially the last two years uh, because of COVID. The people's house is not, the, it's not a lot of people in the people's house. We need to get people back in there. We'll see what's going on. We've had so much done under the cloak of darkness because nobody's really there. Nobody's engaged. Well, how do we fix that by bringing people into the process? And once again, like I said, establishing some of these committees and, and commissioning some working groups to solve some of these problems and come back to the legislature. The, the legislature is not all knowing. It is not omnipotent. It is not all powerful. We've got to return some of that back to the people and allow them to come in and influence legislation the way it's intended. And right now that's just not happening. Huh. So how uh, does how does the lieutenant governor office work if there is a democratic uh, lieutenant governor, a Republican governor, and a, and a Republican majority. Same way. Same way. They, they, there's, there is nothing they can do to stop me from doing everything I just talked about. Okay. Um, now, the only, thing, the only thing we won't have a governor, that, a Democratic governor drawing the budget, but that don't mean that right. my, my task force on equity can't sit there and, and, and tell the people exactly what they're getting. You know, right. call out the legislators that are supporting it. There's nothing that stops me from making the same appointments to authorities and boards. Uh, you know, people... Um, and I don't know if this is where you're going with it, but everybody wants, you know, talks about how they stripped the lieutenant governor of power. Yeah. <laughs> so that's probably where you're going with it. But, <clears throat> you know, the there are inherent powers um, granted through the Constitution of Georgia. And it says that the powers of the lieutenant governor are granted through the legislature and the governor. Um, <clears throat> but there, there's only so much they can do. The the goal is to have, and it'll, I, I just see it a very unlikely scenario that we right. have a lieutenant governor that's a Democrat and a governor that's a Republican. I, I think those times, with, last time that happened, you had Sonny Perdue who had just beaten Governor Barnes. You had Mark Taylor who won his reelection and was lieutenant governor. And when they stripped Mark Taylor of his power, that was through SR5, Senate Resolution 5, which was law that they had to draft and pass in both chambers. But then a Republican governor had to sign off on it. Mm. So they, you know, as long as we get the backstop of, of a governor, which I can make the whole case, we should do a whole show on why we are living in what we're living in now because 53,000 people didn't show up to vote in 2018. Yeah. But we need to make sure we correct that and get a Democratic governor in place. And then the lieutenant governor will be able to help push that agenda forward and make sure that Georgia is progressing the way we all want it to progress. All right. Now I believe in I believe in timing, and so, you know, although we all was upset that that Stacey Abrams was 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 cheated out of her her election, don't you think that it was best that I mean that she did lose because if twenty twenty, if that was a Democratic governor in office, how brutal would Trump have been? Well, I don't know if he could have been more much more brutal. Than what he <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, but just imagine, I mean, just imagine a Democrat, a black woman, it would have been, you know, she would have been, I mean, her reelection would have been challenging. <laughs> let, let me, let me, let me tell you something. Don't, don't, ain't nobody got to, got to take up for Stacey Abrams. True. true. Okay. Yeah. I mean, in her own right, yeah. Stacey is a force to be reckoned with. Yeah. Um, and regardless of when she's going to catch the fury of whoever. Is yeah. yeah. You know, um, but I, I, I know her. And I trust her that she is going to withstand whatever they throw at her. Um, and, and we, all, I mean, like I said, that there, there are a few of us, uh, you know, that are running statewide that have had that. I mean, I've had everything from the state, the local, the national GOP thrown at me. They, they don't hold punches with anybody. They're gonna get, they're gonna get rough. Oh, okay. It's gonna get tough. Um, but I, I do think, to your point, 
the timing would have been good in 2018. Okay. Because you think about where we are now. We, we've got 159 counties in the state. And I'm chair of one of the four, one of the big four that got robbed of their ability to write their own um, county commission and school board maps and redistricting. Yeah, Cobb, Gwinnett, Gwinnett too, yeah. Cobb, Gwinnett, um, Chatham, and Richmond. Yeah. Okay. Well, the only four out of 159 counties that weren't able to do their job. All minorities. All, well, and, and, and here's the thing. All recent governing minorities. Okay. Right. Re- yeah, recent. All recent. Yeah. They just flipped. Yeah. Okay. Scary. So, you know, it, it is. But what we could have done is had that 53,000 more people vote. And yeah. we would have had a, a Governor Abrams who would have vetoed. Right. And forced them to go back through the local process. Um, so, that, I mean, th- this, I'm telling you, this election matters. It, it matters so much. Not, not only because of what we need to do on our side, but what Donald Trump is waiting on is all his acolytes to be installed across the country. So when he runs again in 2024, the, the vote will truly just be a sham. It does not matter what happens on election day. If he gets his way and installs all of his little acolytes across these different secretary of states, governors, all yeah. these other races, then I, it is almost a foregone conclusion of what's going to happen in the first on the first Tuesday of November 2024. Lord, let's play that don't happen. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And we don't need stop, that. To stop that. <laughs> we need everybody to get out and vote. It, it is important. And and don't do not be complacent to you know what's happening nationally. Oh, Joe Biden's polls in the 30s. Go. I tell you all the time, Georgia got Georgia. Georgia didn't need Joe Biden to flip these seats. Georgia didn't need Joe Biden to, I mean. Joe Biden is going to be an asset regardless of what we do, but Georgia got Georgia. We are going to get on the ground. We are going to energize. We are going to organize, and we are going to mobilize. No matter how they try to strip away our rights to vote and make it more difficult, we are going to get out there and prove to them it does not work. What's going to be the... Oh, sorry. I was just going to say to that, you have people who are who are who will be facing some challenges when it comes to voting. So what are some? Because I because me personally, when they were talking about all the different ways that you cannot vote, I'm thinking, well, we just gonna go get some buses and pick them all up and bring them down to the voting poll or br- drop the ballots off. What what are some what are some of the things we can do to make sure that people can get to the polls and vote? You know, most of it's education. We we, we gotta we gotta educate. Most of what changes on timing and access, basically. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot fewer drop boxes. So we got to make sure we let them know where they are, you know, we gotta, and when you can go, because timing, then now they're only open the same hours you're going to go early vote and in those same locations. Wow. Um, you know, you can you can apply for your absentee. Let me look in the camera and tell everybody, listen, you can apply for your absentee ballot today. They, they will first start being shipped on April 5th. So mm. early voting starts May 2nd. We need to just be drilling these things into people's heads. You can go out and apply right now for your that way. If you run into any hiccups, it is it is March. You got yeah. until May to get it fixed. Now, what's gonna be the the driving motivation this prime for Democrats uh to get out to vote? You know, because because Warnot is basically unopposed, Stacy is basically unopposed. So what's gonna be that driving force in May? Because we know November, oh, oh, you know, they're gonna show up. Hopefully, but what's going to be that driving force in May to get the people out to, to and to make them realize that this is, you know, a serious primary. If if you if you want to, if you want to have a say in what the government of a go, of a Governor Abrams looks like, that's why you're going out to vote. If you want to make sure that she has a competent Secretary of State, a competent Lieutenant Governor, a competent um, Attorney General that'll have her back and will understand on day one how to govern and how to get things done. That's why you go out and vote. We can't leave this to chance. I'm sorry. I, 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 I firmly believe, as every candidate that comes on should, that I am the best person to be the lieutenant governor for, for all the reasons that I outlined. I, I'm, I'm not running on rhetoric. I'm running on a record. As I said, I'm the only person in this race who has ever won in November. That's, that matters. We need someone who can get it all the way across the finish line. I'm the only person in this race with a perfect score from the NAACP. I'm the only person that scored a perfect rating from Georgia Conservation Voters on the Environment. 
I was the 2021 Legislator of the Year from the Georgia Mental Health Consumer Network. I've got the receipts, as they say, to show that this is not about rhetoric and all these talking points. We need to elect people that have done the work and who know how to do the work when they get in these offices. So that's why turnout is important. Because if you leave it to fate, you may leave it with a ticket that's not going to be the best ticket to get across the finish line in November. And that hurts everybody at the top that you stay at home because you don't get a chance to vote for. Mm. Now, number two, now that was that was the person. But number two, this is the best dry run you can have. All you talked about, all the different changes to the voting law. When I tell people, you don't want November to be the first time you confront SB 202. Yeah. You need to get out in the primary and do it. So you know where your drop box is. You know what time it's open. You know how to apply online for your absentee ballot. All of the, do your dry run. Do it now because we cannot wait to November for you to do this for the first time. Wow. Wow. All right. Well, I, I, I was sitting up here smiling because you said, I got the receipts. I'm like, not the receipts, though. Not the receipts. <laughs> I, 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 mean, I, I think everyone would agree, and everybody I've talked to agrees that <clears throat> it is important <clears throat> to have that experience. You know, there, there are certain jobs you can get where on the job training is okay. But I can tell you from walking into that building on my first day as a state legislator, it can be overwhelming, not because you're not capable, but because there's so much to learn. But if you're in the House, you know, I'm, a, I'm one of 180. When I first got there, I had a leader, I had a chairman, I had all kind of people that had been there a while, they could show me the ropes, how to interact with this and that. And, you know, you, you learn that over time. If you walk in there with no experience as lieutenant governor, you're one of one. Mm -hmm. hey, ain't nobody there to help you. Wow. Ain't nobody, you, you are one of one. You are you are at the top. So I don't even think people understand the job that they're running for. This this is not a platform job this is to launch into something else. This is for those that are prepared, those that are experienced, and those that will add value day one to what they have to accomplish. Otherwise, they're going to get shredded apart. The, the, you, you, the biggest threat to an uh, inexperienced lieutenant governor, as you all talked about, Derek, you mentioned, is the fact that they're going to be in a chamber that's run by Republicans. If you have never been in there and been in that environment and you don't know the people in the chamber, you don't know the people in the halls, and you don't know the people outside, then you're going to struggle. Some jobs require a little bit of experience. Wow. All right. Well, there you have it, sir. People, everybody you watching. Heard it. You heard it right here. That's that's pretty, you know, and oh yeah, okay. So listen, how can people get in contact with you to support the campaign and su support the work that you're doing? Yeah, so you can follow the campaign at allenforgeorgia.com uh, or allenforga.com, however you want to put it in. Uh, if you want to email me directly, uh, you can email rep allen at allenforgeorgia.com. Uh, and if you uh, want to get in touch with the uh, campaign, you can do 678-852-5347. Uh, uh, happy to hear from you. If you got any follow-up, want to talk about what we talked about, I, I don't I don't just say it. I mean it. It's an open-door policy. Whatever you want to chat about, give me a call when I can find a time. Just, you know, give it to when we're out of session. We still got two more weeks before, we, <laughs> before we're done. Uh, but it's going to be a little busy. But, uh, but I'd be happy to talk with you about any issues uh, that come up. And thank you guys for the platform. You do a great show. Thank now, so no, no, Derek. I don't know if she did it because we did it to every other state rep. <laughs> uh, any other any legislators updates that you would like to provide? Uh, I know there was a lot of uh, I mean, this has been an interesting session. <laughs> That's one word. <laughs> when you're on the inside, I don't know if I use the word interesting. <laughs> it's, it's, it's been a lot, you know, and, and so, you know, you know, we're in Gwinnett yep. and and so I'm going to be totally honest that I haven't really followed a lot of things that was coming out of Cobb, but I do know Cobb had his issues as well, because I want to say if it's, I think it was Cobb County where they just basically wrote out a whole commissioner, right? Yeah, they, they drew Commissioner Richardson, basically shortened her term by drawing her out of a district that is into a district that's now up for election this year, which means once that election is settled, she will have to resign because she doesn't meet the residency requirements of the new district. So, and, and it's not just her. Think, wow. think, so here's what I tell people, Cobb, Cobb County, you had three black women all elected 2018, 2020. You had Lucy McBath, 
elected by a majority of East Cobb voters drawn out of Cobb. You had Sharice Davis, first African-American female to serve on the school board, drawn out. You had Jerrica Richardson, first African-American commissioner representing District 2, drawn out. This is not by accident. This is by design. And, and what, you know, you're going to make you gonna make us launch into a whole new show. But what, what we've got to be careful of, and I mean this sincerely, what we've got to be very careful of is not just the attack on our, the franchisement of voting, the access of it. But this sets a very dangerous precedent that if they don't like the outcome of a vote, they can overturn it through reapportionment. Yeah. Georgia does not have any law that prohibits redistricting being done at any point. It does not have to happen every 10 years. There's redistricting going on all the time. Oh, wow. Okay, there is nothing that prohibits that. So if, if, we, if we sit by and let this happen, what we're really saying is we are okay with the laws of Georgia allowing a majority to draw out duly elected members of the minority party because they don't like the outcome of elections. That is very, very dangerous. And that's that's where I'm hoping um, legal action can be successful because we can't have that precedent. Because it's Cobb County today. It, it's Gwinnett next time. It's and, and it may not even be in 10 years. That's what I'm trying to tell you. This could be next session. If they get away with this, this could wow. be next session. They start to target all of those commissioners they don't like or school board members that win that they don't like and can shorten their term by drawing them out of their district. Wow. I didn't even now, know that. I thought it was only every 10 years. I didn't even know no, that. There, there is nothing that prohibits reapportionment from happening at any moment. It, it, for example, in Cobb, we did the 2012. Um, the re, and This is all still about District 2, really. In 2012, the maps were court drawn because of some issues. In 2015, they came back and drew District 2 again just to protect the incumbent. Uh, they tried to come back and do it again in 2017, but it was unsuccessful. Everybody kind of backed away from it a little bit, and that's when everything started to, to shift. But there's nothing that prevents you from redrawing and tinkering with the lines at any point. Wow. You know, I've asked this question on the show. You can't be a professional, but the local district uh, commission right. and school board. I'm sorry, Audrey. I'm sorry. I've asked that on the, on the show before, and I've asked it to some sitting um, um, leaders. What can we do? And, and I've heard one person say, well, nothing we can do. I just got to go out there and fight my fight. So you're saying there is something that can be done. What is that something? I, I would love to come back when we get further along into the legal process and talk about it. Okay. Um, Are you a lawyer? Are you an attorney by trade? No, I'm not. Oh, okay. No, I'm not. Um, but I, I will. I, I will be more than happy to give updates as updates come. Okay. Um, okay. This, this, the Cobb County maps will be challenged on several fronts. Um, the other thing we can do does that include the federal too? Um, no. Okay. There's already been a ruling on congressional maps. I don't know if you all. So the a federal judge has already given a ruling that we will, basically, we will have 2022 elections on the current map. There's a, a trial date set for 2023. So there's a possibility that if, the, if things go well in the in the federal courts, there could be a new map for 2024. But for this election, these federal maps are what they are. We're going to be running on these maps. Uh, I would expect that to be the same case for any state map as well. This challenge this late. Uh, it's just too, it's too late. I mean, like I said, ballots are going to start being shipped on April 5th. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's pretty much too late. Um, too late now. But to, to the point of what what can we do when people say we can't do anything? elect the governor that would veto these bills yeah. full stop if you if donald trump won the presidency off one message to core conservative voters y'all remember what that was make the america court, great, the great. The courts the oh. courts. he he oh. had a narrative to that he was going to conservative judges all the way across the board and he was going to control the courts mm. and and republicans looked the other way from him grabbing folks to everything else because they said we want to own the courts. Yeah. Democrats, we got to get a single mind on this. We need to stop bad legislation. I don't care how you feel about what's going on in DC. I don't care how frustrated you are with anything else. We need your vote to put Abrams in office so that we can stop 
bad legislation. That is the only thing that's going to stop these other counties from coming after the elected officials. Oh, wow. All right, we got to wrap it up. Wait, wait, oh. wait. One question, Derek. I got one. Oh, I'm uh, Stacy's <laughs> your friend, and we would love to have her on this show. Can you put in a word for us? I, I do not handle that scheduling. Um, no, just, no, just put in a word. I don't need you to handle the schedule. Just put in a word for it. Okay? I, 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 would, I think every candidate should come to your show. So I, I will tell you. We, we done had pretty much all of them. We need Stacy now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. I mean, but you can tell everybody else. <laughs> as we as, as we work as we work our way up, and just a quick one, you know, we ran into each other yesterday, yeah. And so uh, I just I'm just you know again I believe in timing, so I just yeah. I'm glad that we uh, was able to connect. And speaking of timing, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. This has yeah. truly been eye opening, and it gives me and the rest of the voters, I'm sure, a lot to think about. Um, moving forward and making sure we get out there and vote for the right candidates. I want to thank you for your time and your commitment and your service to our community and to our state. Thank you. Thank you for your service as well. This is truly a public service. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Listen, y'all heard it right here. Listen, get out there and vote. Do not mess around, play around. This is a very important election. Go to the go to the polls in May and go back in November. Don't go in May. Don't go in November. You got to go both times because they're very important. But thank you again for listening. We'll be back here next Sunday. Same bat time, same bat place. Y'all stay safe out there. And until next time, make a great day. Bye, everybody. You've been listening to Popcorn in Politics. What's the real deal? Hosted by Audrey Bell Kearney and Derek J. Wilson. Be sure to subscribe to the show and share it with your family and friends. To support the show, visit us on the web at www.popcornandpolitics.com. Connect with us on Facebook at Progressive Popcorn and on Instagram at Popcorn Politics Podcast. 